Coral reefs are among the most species-rich environments on Earth. More than 6,000 species of fishes and many thousand more invertebrates are known to inhabit reefs in tropical seas around the globe. The shallow coral reef fish fauna has become reasonably well known since the advent of scuba diving and the pioneering activities of diving ichthyologists like John Randall, Gerald Allen, and others. Thanks to their efforts, relatively few shallow reef fishes remain to be discovered. Conventional scuba has been an effective tool for exploring coral reefs. Many reef-associated organisms are small, cryptic, or otherwise not apt to be captured by hook and line, set nets, or traps. The rocky and complex geomorphology typical of this habitat renders trawls effectively useless. For many reef inhabitants, there's virtually no way to know of their existence without visiting their world directly. But as effective as scuba has been for exploring the underwater realm, it has practical limitations. Nitrogen, which comprises nearly 80% of the air we breathe, causes mind-muddling narcosis when breathed under high pressure. And the life-giving oxygen actually becomes toxic. Moreover, as the depth of the dive increases, the risk of decompression sickness increases dramatically, and an ever larger quantity of breathing gas is wasted with each breath. With such limitations, practical exploration is limited to a maximum depth of about 200 feet, and the vast majority of diving activity is focused on depths less than about half of this. Deep sea submersibles and remotely operated underwater video cameras allow access to much greater depths and much longer durations in scuba, but use of submersibles for deep reef exploration has its own limitations. Submersibles are very expensive to own and operate. As a consequence, most submersible use has been in the more topographically austere regions below the deep reef environment, often well in excess of 500 feet. The habitat that lies below the depths of scuba, but shallower than the domain of deep sea submersibles, roughly two to five hundred feet beneath the surface, remains almost entirely unexplored. This region has been referred to as the coral reef twilight zone, both because of the low ambient light levels and because it is the realm of the unexpected, the unknown, and sometimes the bizarre. The Association for Marine Exploration was founded in large part to address this gap in our understanding of coral reef ecosystems. Our board members include a mixture of talented marine scientists and some of the world's most experienced divers. Our mission is to conduct and facilitate innovative scientific exploration of undersea environments through the novel application of advanced diving equipment and techniques. The most important tool for gaining access to the coral reef twilight zone is the mixed gas closed circuit rebreather. Closed circuit rebreathers offer three major advantages over open circuit scuba. They're quieter, they allow divers to stay underwater longer, and they make deep diving more practical. With conventional scuba, the diver's exhaled breath is wasted as a cloud of bubbles. The deeper the dive, the more gas that is lost. A rebreather captures and recirculates the diver's breath in a closed breathing loop. The carbon dioxide exhaled by the diver is removed from the breathing loop as it passes over the scrubber, a canister of a chemical absorbent material. The oxygen consumed by the diver is replenished from a small supply cylinder located inside the rebreather. Another internal cylinder contains a diluent a gas supply like air which is dynamically mixed with the oxygen in the breathing loop to avoid problems associated with oxygen toxicity. Because the breathing gas is recirculated, there is very little waste, and these two small cylinders are enough to allow a diver to stay underwater for six to ten hours, or more, regardless of depth. A second diluent gas supply containing helium is attached externally. Unlike the nitrogen in air, Helium does not cause narcosis when breathed under pressure, 
and is thus essential for allowing access to depths greater than can be safely reached using conventional scuba gear. A secondary oxygen supply is also attached externally, both to allow longer dive times and to serve as an emergency backup supply. Managing all of these different gas supplies can be quite a complicated task. To make the job easier, the rebreather is equipped with a special gas control system, so the diver has full manual control over the breathing mixture. The rebreather is also equipped with a sophisticated electronic system the most critical component of which are the triple redundant oxygen sensors. Readings from these and other sensors are analyzed by three separate computer processors, any one of which is capable of controlling the entire system. Oxygen readings, decompression status, and other important information and warnings are provided to the diver through various displays, including a heads-up display located in front of the diver's mask. Life support equipment as sophisticated as this requires years of training and hundreds of hours of experience. Much forethought and preparation is needed before each dive to make certain that everything is functioning properly. With the requisite training, experience, and preparation, however, we can use rebreathers to explore undersea habitats down to 500 feet or more while maintaining adequate margins of safety. Leaving the surface behind, we free fall down the reef like slow motion skydivers. As we descend, the environment begins to change. The stony corals so dominant on the shallow reef give way to soft corals, gorgonians, and a wide array of other colorful encrusting marine life. It also gets darker. The surface water filters out much of the sunlight leaving only the blue wavelengths to penetrate this deep. Though dimly lit, the water at this depth contains very little plankton and can be astonishingly clear. One can often see for great distances horizontally at these depths. An absence of light does not mean an absence of color. Illuminated by our dive lights, the vivid splendor of the deep reef ecosystem is revealed. We have found a great variety of habitats in the twilight zone. Many areas are as teeming with life as any shallow coral reef habitat. Reef drop-offs plunge almost vertically from near the surface down thousands of feet. Ancient limestone shorelines, carved when the sea level was 300 feet lower, offer refuge to schools of fish. Fossil shallow reefs, drowned long ago by rising sea levels, provide excellent shelter for new deep reef residents. Vertical zonation of reef habitat may be as profound on the deep coral reefs as it is for shallow coral reef environments. For example, this rocky ledge 300 feet deep off Hawaii supports a very different assemblage of species than this outer reef ledge 80 feet deeper, even though they're only a short swim apart. This faunal break may be due to the presence of a strong thermocline below 300 feet. There are other environmental factors that influence deep reef faunal assemblages, such as bottom topography, currents and upwellings, and orientation to the path of the sun. Walls facing north or south, such as this one, tend to be austere, whereas east or west facing walls receive more sunlight and seem to harbor more prolific life. Undoubtedly, there are other environmental factors we are not yet aware of, for we are still strangers in this strange deep realm. One creepy cave we found in over 300 feet in Fiji brought home this twilight zone strangeness. The walls of this huge chamber were a living, undulating carpet of thousands of carnivorous shrimp which would swarm over your hand and attempt to devour you if you just touched the wall. 300 feet down a Papua New Guinea reef, large rubble mounds two or more meters across lay scattered across the reef slope. Close inspection reveals the architect hovering nearby, a small gray tile fish, brand new to science. These small fish build their home by assembling a volcano-like mound bit by bit from pieces of coral rubble that tumble down to their deep domain. They hover above the entrance to their mound, feeding on the passing parade of plankton, and dive into the throat of the volcano when predators threaten. 
Incomparable depth off Fiji, a similar looking species was recently photographed living quite literally in a hole in the wall. The Fiji fish appears more slender than the mound builder, and it really doesn't look like it would have the brawn for heavy construction work. So are these separate species? Without further study, one can only speculate. A characteristic common to many species of fishes inhabiting these depths is highly contrasting color patterns. Perhaps these broad, dark, and pale bands and stripes make it easier for mates to keep track of each other under reduced light levels. Curiously, in many cases the dark bars and stripes are red rather than black. No red wavelengths reach these depths from the surface, so in the absence of artificial light the most vivid crimson is merely black. So why the color? We really don't know, but perhaps red pigments carry a lower metabolic cost to produce. Deep reef fishes are not the black, long-fanged creatures of the abyss, or our nightmares. Rather, they are closely related to the familiar shallow reef fishes. As one might expect, they tend to have larger eyes than their shallow reef relatives, and families that feed on coral or algae are poorly represented, but most deep reef fishes would not look too out of place on a shallow reef. Below 300 feet, Around half the fishes we encounter are not yet scientifically described. These are just some of the fishes we have collected. To an ichthyologist, perhaps the strangest thing about this deep reef fauna is its distribution pattern. Shallow reef species have vast ranges across the Pacific. Although we encounter a few of these deep reef species almost everywhere we go, the majority are only found at one locality. Most appear to be restricted to only one island group. This little beauty has been only seen in one particular location in Fiji, despite many deep exploratory dives at other reef in this archipelago. This deep reef endemism was unexpected and seems counterintuitive. We honestly don't know what is going on here, and really can only speculate without more information and study. How large is this deep reef fauna? Preliminary estimates, extrapolated from the few data points we have, indicate a fauna of several thousand undescribed fishes. This is huge. Roughly 6,000 coral reef fishes are presently known from the Indo-Pacific region. There may be one-third that number waiting to be discovered in the deep reef realm below scuba depth. With rebreathers and expedition support, we have the technology to bring these fishes to light, and at an impressive rate. With our repertoire of ichthyological tools and techniques, we have collected more than seven new species per hour, This is really just the tip of the deep reef faunal iceberg. We have only just begun, and for every new fish there may be dozens of deep reef invertebrates awaiting discovery. Our explorations of the deep reef are so new that presently, as you may have gathered, we have more questions than answers. Eventually, with research, we will find answers to most of these questions. But what really intrigues and excites us are the unknown unknowns, the things we will surely find in and about the deep reef that we cannot even imagine now. Mm -hmm.